Okay, we'll go ahead and get started now. On behalf of the Z. Smith Reynolds Library Lecture Series Committee, I would like to welcome you to the third library lecture of spring 2016. This particular lecture has been in the making since April of 2015 when Chris Burris and I met with Justin long before we knew that this was going to fall right smack dab in the middle of Global Wake Forest Week. And speaking of Global Wake Forest Week, if you've not picked up your goodies, please get your luggage tag and all the things that go with it, and it fits perfectly into this week providentially. We have anticipated this lecture for a long time, and so it is an honor for us to introduce to you Justin Catanoso, I love the way it rolls off your tongue, Associate uh, Professor and Director of the Journalism Program at Wake Forest University. Justin Catanoso is a uh, North Carolina-based journalist with 30 years of experience in covering climate change, health care, economic development, and travel. He is a Pulitzer Prize nominee and winner of the Science and Society Award for his coverage of, fr of fraud in the tobacco industry in the early 1990s. He is current reporting on the impact of climate change, especially in the tropics, is supported by the Pulitzer Center on crisis reporting in Washington, D.C., and the Center for Energy, Environment, and Sustainability at Wake Forest. Recent work has focused on the intersection of faith and environment protection. I think that's what we're going to talk about today. He has covered two U.N. climate summits in, in Lima in 2014 and in Paris in 2015. He has published travel stories and journalism from the U.S., Italy, Austria, Thailand, Peru, Belize, Canada, and France. He has worked at daily newspapers in New Jersey, Pennsylvania, Tennessee, and North Carolina. And his freelance writing has appeared in the New York Times, Los Angeles Times, Business Week, National Public Radio, which is where I've heard him for the first time, National Geographic Daily News, News and Observer in Raleigh, um, Charlotte Observer, News and Record of Greensboro, GlobalPulseMagazine.com, BusinessInsider.com, AOL Travel, and I like this one, Airline Magazines for U.S. Airways and Delta. On a local note, Justin Catanoso is our advisor to Wake Forest University's Old Gold and Black. Do we have a representative or a reporter from there right now? Are you reporting? Glad you're here. Glad to have somebody here. Um, okay, Justin is truly, it is truly an honor to have you with us today, and we look forward to hearing your lecture titled, The Pope, Peru, and Paris. Welcome. Justin. That was a lovely introduction. Joy, thank you very much, and, and Christian, thank you also for the invitation. It really has been more than a year since we started planning this, and, uh, and at the time, I wasn't sure exactly what I would be talking about, but I knew uh, that given this new role that I have in covering climate change globally, that things were going to happen, and um, in, in, since we talked, uh, I have been uh, back to Peru. I spent three weeks there last summer, and we're going to talk about that first. Uh, I had the great opportunity with the generosity of a grant from SEAS to cover the Paris uh, Peace Accords, which are Paris Climate uh, Accords, which we, will, which we will get to in, in the last part of my talk. Um, what I want to do is, is set this in a little bit of context first and, uh, and, and, and put it in the context of the guy who sort of um, is making all this possible. The guy who has taken climate change and made it real for so many more people in the world who we're talking about uh, is Pope Francis. And um, this is the papal encyclical. I had the great opportunity while I was in Rome last summer to actually cover the press conference where this encyclical was released. And so my, my copy um, is from the Vatican, which is, which is kind of neat. And I have a favorite passage that I want to open with. It is uh, it's passage 32, and it reads, the Earth's resources are being plundered because of the short-sighted approaches to the economy, commerce, and production. The loss of forests and woodlands entails the loss 
species which may constitute extremely important resources in the future, not only for food but also for curing disease and other uses. Each year sees the disappearance of thousands of plant and animal species which we will never know, which our children will never see, because they have been lost forever. The great majority become extinct for reasons related to human activity. Because of us, thousands of species will no longer give glory to God by their very existence, nor convey their message to us. We have no such right. It's a powerful statement. We have no such right. But we have this need to live. We have this need to make a living. And we have this need for people to have jobs. And so last summer, after this was released, the Pulitzer Center on Crisis Reporting asked me to go to a Latin American country and, uh, and, and see how this encyclical was being received. Go to a Latin American country where the Pope enjoys more than 80% approval rating, where the population is more than 75% Catholic, and those who aren't Catholic are indigenous, Indians. And so I did. I went and spent two uh, visits to, uh, to, um, uh, to Peru, and I chose Peru because it's a country that I know well because of my uh, best friend here and mentor, uh, biology professor. I don't know what that sound is. Uh, because of, because of uh, a mentor of mine, and that is uh, biologist Miles Stillman, who invited me to come to Peru with him in, uh, in, in the summer of 2013 and to hike down through the Andes in the Amazon jungle to understand his research, which is the impact of rising temperatures on tropical forests. But in going to Peru last summer, I had another mission, and that was to see whether this document was having an impact on politicians, on business people, on economists, on teachers, on the clergy, on the people at large. And one of the things I did was I tried to identify one of the most contentious uh, environmental battles going on in Peru, and there are a lot of them. But I, I think I found, if not the most contentious uh, conflict, then, then one of them. And it is in Arequipa. So I want to point out where I'm going to be talking about for the next few minutes. places on earth. Driving the two hours from Arequipa uh, west toward the coast was like driving not across the moon but across Mars. There is absolutely no rain there. But I headed into this town of Cocachacra, which is about 54,000 people, and it is a farm community. There's no mining there, and mining is really, really important to Peru. Peru is... Um, is an amazing dichotomy of, uh, of, um, of a treasure chest on one hand, of, of, of commodities such as gold and silver and uh, zinc and lead. And on the other hand, on the eastern slope of the Andes, it's, it's Noah's Ark. It's this lush Amazon jungle. It's the fourth largest rainforest in the world, and the biodiversity there is off the charts. In Miles Silman's study field, it's just this one slope of the Andes includes like one-sixth of all the species on Earth, one out of six of all bird species in particular. It's just incredible, the biodiversity that's in this country, and half of it, and the other half, is a desert. So I go to Coca Chakra for a reason, and the reason is that the government likes to give out licenses for mining. Now, most of the mining takes place in the Andes, and it takes place in the northern part of the country and the southern part of the country, but they decided, for reasons unclear to me, to approve a copper mine, a gigantic copper mine, right next to a farm valley, a very vulnerable farm valley in a very arid area. So what we're talking about is this um, <laughs> verdant stretch of green surrounded by desert that is fed by one glacier uh, river. Uh, these are the workers in Cucachacra that line up in the morning to go out and do the farm work. When I was there, Cucachacra was under martial law. This mine was approved six years ago. But there's this 
general agreement in Peru that nothing really happens, nothing can go forward until there's a general consensus in the community that this project can go forward. There are 15,000 farm uh, families that make a living and generate about $100 million a year in revenue. Uh, some of it is for their own use, some of it is for exports, they grow rice, they grow sugar cane, they grow all kinds of uh, root vegetables. Um, they, uh, they manage to make a living in all these small plots. There's no industrialized farming that's going on in Cuca Chakra. It's all very small. And they only have one statue in town. And the statue is to a farmer. And there's never been any mining in Coca Chakra. But they've been farming there for over 200 years. And so this is the river. This is the Tamba River. And, uh, and this is the Farm Valley. These are some of the workers. And this is the mayor. This is the mayor of Coca Chakra. And what you see behind us is the mine site. This is where they're going to put in a copper mine if it ever goes forward. It's going to be about three quarters of a mile across and 1,500 feet deep. And I don't know how familiar you are with copper mining, but it's a, it's a very toxic kind of operation. This is an open pit mine. And what comes out of open pit mines when you're mining copper is sulfur dioxide. And sulfur dioxide is a really, really toxic chemical that when it gets into the soil, it kills it, and nothing can grow. There's almost nothing worse than you can do next to a farm valley and put in a copper mine that's an open pit that's going to send up all this sulfur dioxide dust and spread out all over the leaves and get into the ground and kill off the living of 15,000 farm families. But this is a $1.4 billion project that promises to pull some uh, 120,000 tons of copper, not totally, but annually for 18 years until that big hole in the ground is empty. Now keep in mind, Peru is an interesting country because it is desperate to rise, as most of these poor countries are, and it wants to exploit its natural resources as it has every right to do, as we have exploited our natural resources. But we've reached this point right now where the balance is tipped. And so the Pope stands up and he says, we need to be careful. We need to think about what we were doing. We can actually take too much of our natural resources out of the ground. We can actually make things uninhabitable. And so what Mayor Hellier is doing is he's showing me this area. And he's showing me how deep this mine is going to be. And then I turn around, and I literally just turn around. And there's your farm valley. And there's the Tamba River. And that's how close it is. And suddenly you get this sense of the difficult choices that Peru has to make. Suddenly you get this sense that even though they love this pope, 82% approval ratings, those are pretty high. <coughs> Three out of four people being Catholic, that, that's really high. And yet this encyclical is a very controversial document there among a lot of people. So I go and I meet with the priest in town because I, fig I figure You've got this situation going on with this mine. The farmers have risen up, and they've stopped this mine from going forward for six years. In the process, the government has declared martial law in Coca Chakra. It's actually sent troops in the Coca Chakra, this little town, to actually fire bullets at the farmers that are protesting this mine. Six farmers have been killed in the last couple of years, protesting this mine going in. And I go to see this priest with my interpreter. And he was not happy to see me because um, he doesn't know a whole lot about Laudato Si, which is the name of the papal encyclical. And while he loves the pope, he's not really an activist. He essentially told me, you know what? I'm really good at weddings. I'm really, really good at baptisms. I do a good funeral. I say a good mass. I'm a real believer. But I'm not a fighter. And, uh, and it makes me uncomfortable to choose sides, and so I'm trying not to choose sides. And so I dig into this document as a journalist, and I read to him the passage that says, the clergy needs to take sides. 
The clergy needs to stand up for the environment. They need to stand up for the poor. And I said, you know, your boss is actually telling you what to do. He would prefer that you have a little more courage. And I got that look. <laughs> but then I got this look. As a journalist, I have had the opportunity to meet so many remarkable people. I've been a journalist for a really long time. I've, I've, I've interviewed candidates for president. I've interviewed UN ambassadors. I've interviewed amazing scientists. I've, I've interviewed uh, my favorite musicians. Um, I, I, you get used to it. And it's just is a part of your job. And you don't get overwhelmed. And you don't get impressed. And you don't get nervous. And then Jose Cornejos walks into the room. And his charisma is such that it's electrifying. He's a farmer, and uh, he's the head of the farm uh, opposition. And, and I actually thought that he was a white collar guy, you know, and I was waiting to meet him all day. And I just thought he was going to come in and be wearing a suit and a tie and have soft hands and clean fingernails. And the first thing I did was I looked at the dirt under his fingernails, and I realized that he'd been farming all morning. And he knew nothing about Laudato Si. He knew nothing about the papal encyclical. Because in Peru, the media is controlled by one family. And that family is very pro-business. And so they actually didn't report very much on this document. But they wrote a, a fair number of editorials saying that the pope should mind his own business, that he should stick to theology and stay away from climate science. But one of the things that happened at the press conference in Rome when this was released was that they had summary translations in different languages. And so I knew I was going to Peru. I took the summary translation in Spanish. I made dozens of copies of it. And I handed it out to people everywhere where I was doing interviews. And I gave the six-page document to Mr. Cornelius. And he read through it. And he said, this gives us hope. We're starting to lose hope. This Mexican company is wearing us down. This martial law is wearing us down. But now you're telling me the Pope is on our side. And we won't back down. And he told me, as long as the people oppose this mine and the numbers that we have on our side, the mine will not go forward. Until the government starts to listen, we will fight. They know that if there uh, continues to be re revolts here, the uprisings will spread across the country. And that's what they fear the most. That's what they fear the most. It was inspiring to be in the presence of someone with so much courage. And the fact of the matter is, this is the kind of guy who may not be alive six months from now. Now, the heat is coming off this particular mine because commodity prices have dropped in the same way that oil prices have dropped. And so this Mexican company is saying, you know what, maybe it's not the time to dig this mine, but they still have the license, and this mine's going to happen sooner or later. And then you realize that the guy in the middle is this guy. This is the Minister of the Environment in Peru. And uh, he has a tough job because his job really is to protect the environment. But his job is also uh, to sign off on licenses for mining. And he approved of the license for this Mexican company with an awful environmental record to go into Coca Chakra and dig an open pit copper mine after they failed their first environmental impact study. And he approved it because he said, I think that mining and farming can coexist in the same area. And with all due respect, I said, Mr. Minister, I don't think that's possible. And he said, well, we'll see. We'll see. In the course of my reporting, I also got to interview this guy. This is the richest man in Peru. His name is Roque Benavites. He is the CEO of Buenaventura, the largest precious metals mining company in the country. Silver, copper, gold. He has hundreds of mines. And uh, he gave me an hour of his time. And uh, I didn't expect to meet the devil. Uh, I, I was the editor of a business newspaper for a long time. And, uh, and I understand business people fairly well. They're very nuanced. They're very complicated. And they can be very big hearted. Even when they're really rich, this guy's really rich. His company's on the New York Stock Exchange. And he was very persuasive that, that his company does mining in a responsible way, that they pay their people well, that they have um, environmental protections, that they have health insurance, that they mend the damage that they do once a mine uh, is, is uh, finished being mined. 
uh, and that they give back to the communities as they are legally supposed to do. And I walked away from that meeting thinking this was a pretty good guy. He answered my questions. He was very candid with me. He answered uh, very difficult questions that I asked him. At one point I said, do you believe climate change is man-made? And he said, no. And I went, oh man, we've just been talking for 50 minutes and you started to win me over and now you're going to tell me you don't believe climate change is man-made? And he said, look, we're a geology company. We know the climate record. We dig down deep. We can see what climate, how the climate has changed over the millennia. And I said, with all due respect, Mr. Benavides, we have never raised the temperature of the Earth 1.8 degrees Fahrenheit in 100 years. And he sat back in his chair and he said, fossil fuels. And I went, OK, so it's not your fault. You're an excavator. You're not an oil drigger. But why are you telling me, why are you telling me that you don't believe that climate change is man-made? And what that told me, that was my last day on my first trip to Peru, and what it told me is that I needed to go back, and I needed to find some of his minds, and I needed to interview miners. So I have some journalism students here who hear me talking about verification all the time. If all I did was take this guy's word for what a great guy he is and how great his company is, then I would be a little more than a propagandist. And so I, uh, I begged for a little money from C's, and I begged for a little bit more money from the Pulitzer Center, and they gave it to me, and I went back, uh, I went back to a place called La Roya, which I'm going to get to in the next slide. But this lady is Elena Conterno, and she's the head of fisheries. And I don't know how many of you know this, but Peru is one of the world's largest fisheries. They pull 7.2 million tons of fish out of their waters every year, and she is not a fan of the Pope. She thinks he's in over his head. She thinks this document is a crock, that he doesn't even know what he's talking about, that it's embarrassing, that he needs to stick to what he does best, which is preaching. No fan of the Pope. And then you come to La Roya. This is a town at 14,000 feet. It's really high up. You barely breathe there. And what you're looking at is a copper smelting plant. So the only thing worse than, the only thing worse than like, excavating copper is smelting copper. I want you to look at the mountains that surround this plant. This plant has been closed for six years. It closed because the Peruvian government increased their environmental standards by about this much. It was an American company that owned it. And they said, you know what? There are no environmental standards in Chile. We're going to move this place there. So after 77 years, this little town of 32,000 people that employed 1,600 people, those 1,600 jobs rippled through the entire economy. They closed this plant. There were protests two weeks before I got there. I had interviewed the archbishop of this area, and he was telling me that his life was being threatened on a regular basis by the people that wanted to have this mine reopened. But what I didn't know is that the people that wanted to have the mine reopened, this is the impact of acid rain on a real mountain for 77 years. It changes the chemical structure of it. This is a playground right across from the uh, smelting plant. 100% of the children in La Roya, which is considered one of the most polluted cities on Earth. When those lists are made, the other city that's always on that list is Chernobyl. What I didn't anticipate is just how much they love this smelting plant. It's a part of their culture. This is the city seal. Take a look at what the main visual is on the city seal, the smelting plant. It reminded me of Winston-Salem. And when I first moved here, there were signs all over town that said pride in tobacco. Because when I moved here, Reynolds Tobacco employed 17,000 people. They only employ about 2,000 people now. This is a town that loved its smelting plant, even though 100% of the children there have lead levels in their blood that are eight times higher than the World Health Organization says is acceptable and that the workers there are, are all poisoned by the very work that they do. And that the only person who didn't want this mine to open was the archbishop that I interviewed. And you get to see when you're in a place like this just how important the mining culture is. And you talk to a guy like this and he says, this mine has to reopen. Our entire economy depends on it. It's for sale right now. 
and they're agitating for the government to lower the environmental standards so the sale will go through. And this woman said to me, I love this pope. I love that he's Latin American, but there isn't a single thing that he can say that's more important than this plan opening. And I, I got to tell you, in talking with these miners who work for Mr. Benavites, they told a story that in many ways verified what he said, that they were, they were, they were more happy to work for Buenaventura than they were any of the other mining companies that they worked for. It's not safe work, but they felt that they were paid reasonably well. They'd had health benefits. This particular mine was so remote you couldn't see where it was doing any environmental damage. But you just get this sense of the awful choices that we have to make when it comes to environmental protection. In a country like Peru where education just isn't revered, in a town like La Roya where if you don't have a mining job, you're selling fruit on a street corner. There aren't community colleges there to retrain you for something else like we have community colleges here. This is an area that's lost 150 manufacturing jobs in the last 15 years and we still have the same unemployment rate of 5% because we have amazing community colleges that retrain people and we have economic developers that bring new companies in and it doesn't happen in Peru and it doesn't happen in a lot of poor countries. When you lose your job, you lose your job. And these people, they just want to take care of their families. They don't have the same expectations that we have of moving up, of having a bigger house, of having a nicer car and in some ways of even having heat in their homes. They spent two nights in a hotel, hotel, in La Roya. They didn't have any heat. It was 30 degrees at night. But there were four blankets on the bed and there was flannel sheets and I was warm enough, sort of. So you got to get out of bed in the morning. They do without a lot. They just want to work. They just want to work. And you get this sense that you have this amazing pope that puts out this dramatic document that gets the attention of the world and in a place where you think it should be embraced and where it's going to make change, there's so much pushback. There's so much resistance in government, among the universities, among economists, certainly in the business community, and then even among the poor. The poor that Pope Francis has staked his entire legacy on and one of the reasons that it's complicated is because mining has lifted 50% of, of Peruvians out of poverty in the last 15 years. It's provided these jobs and it's provided these livings despite the dangers. And it's something that you can't ignore. And you realize that when you do your interviews in Lima and you do your interviews in La Roya, it's really different than when you do your interviews in Coca Chakra, where they're fighting for environmental protection there but in other parts of the country, they're like, leave us alone. We love this pope. We love that he's Latin American. <laughs> but stick to your knitting. Stick to theology. And at this point in my talk, I want to shift this whole thing to Paris. Because, uh, because the pope put his document out in June, so it would have an impact on what was going to be one of the most consequential United Nations climate summits ever. This was the 21st climate summit, and as I learned from uh, John Knox, law professor and uh, a UN representative uh, for, for climate change and the poor, and I know that's not your title, John, I can never remember the official title, that <coughs> having 21 summits on climate change means you failed 20 times to do anything. Starting with Kyoto, nothing, nothing. We've lost 20 years when we've known, when we've known the dangers of these rapidly warming temperatures on our environments, on our oceans, and we see the damage. It's all around us. We see it on our coastlines. We see it in droughts, different parts of Africa, in Syria, in California, I mean, you name it. And the ferocity of the storms that come across uh, the Philippines every year, which it used to only come across every 100 years. Now they get one every year. 160 mile an hour winds, are you kidding me? All this carbon dioxide up in the air has created a destabilized climate system. And 195 countries came together in Paris 
last December to see if they could do something about it. And I want to set this up a little bit because every morning that I, that I arrived at the climate summit, I would pass by a statue of Charles Lindbergh because the venue where they were meeting was the airfield called, or the airport now, called La Berge. And it's where Lindbergh landed in 1927, the very first solo flight across the Atlantic. History was made there. And uh, in writing my story for Manga Bay, which is the primary website that I write for now, I wanted to see if I could make use of that image. I hoped that I would be able to make use of that image, that history was made here in 1927 and it would be made here again in 2015. And on the last day of this summit, when the agreement came out, this remarkable thing happened. Delegates from 196 nations, for the first time ever, agreed to reduce their carbon emissions wean the world economy off fossil fuels and give the human race a shot at surviving the rapidly escalating dangers of global warming in the decades ahead, and the price of oil dropped $7 a barrel the next day. It was a thrilling time to be in Paris. And this was three weeks after these terrorist attacks that just sort of took the heart and soul out of this place. And now they're getting their wind back. The Parisians did not want to fail, and they did not want the world to fail as well. And well over 100,000 people crowded the summit venue the evening that this Paris Agreement was released. In a way similar to Lindbergh's landing, they were stunned by the outcome. They were buzzed. They were euphoric. And despite all the gloomy predictions that this was going to fail, just like the previous 20 UN climate summits, history was made. The Paris Agreement, though voluntary and still fuzzy on how these goals are going to be reached and enforced, exceeded the expectations of critics and supporters. And now I'm going to shift this conversation into an area that's relatively new. I want to keep this picture of the, of the miners up there because they have a lot of faith. They have a faith in Pope Francis. <laughs> so when this agreement was read and absorbed and reported, there was this bolt of optimism that passed through faith leaders that were there in Paris, and they were there in force. And it spread around the world, and they sensed that their moment had arrived. And as the UN climate participants celebrated, I dashed into the media center, and I stopped the very first person I recognized, who happened to be a guy named Joe Ware. He's a spokesman for a group in London called Christian Aid, which is a faith-based group that's dedicated to environmental protection. He was breathless. He just finished reading this 31-page document, and he told me, creation care. That's a phrase that the Pope coined in Laudato Si. Creation care is what the Paris Agreement is all about, and creation care is at the heart of every world faith. For too long, the movement has been hijacked by environmentalists, who are the good guys, really, but they only scared people away. <coughs> the church is now playing catch-up, even the Catholic Church, which moves at glacial speed. But now it's in the forefront, thanks to Pope Francis's climate change and environmental leadership. He was excited. This was considered, and still is considered, the faith community's moment. So two days after the Paris Agreement was signed, I traveled to Rome, which, as you know, is the seat of the Catholic Church, and I had interviews arranged to test a premise. Would 1.2 billion Catholics, joined by Protestants, Jews, Muslims, and Hindus, leave behind these divisive issues, such as gay marriage and abortion? Would they come together instead to fill a vacuum in environmental leadership left by politicians, around the world who have largely ignored melting ice caps and rising sea levels decide what the money, power, and carbon pollution of big oil, gas, and coal. I met with a nun named Sister Sheila Kinsey, and she told me, people are saying this is the Catholic hour, the Christian hour. She runs the Justice, Peace, and Integrity of Creation Committee, which works for environmental protection around the world. And she said, we are dealing with issues that are critical to human nature. There has to be a way to come together and do this right. To, pro to protect the environment and human rights, we can go to the moon for goodness sake. Why can't we deal with this? So let me roll this back and put this in a little bit of context again. Pope Francis brings this encyclical out in June and it helps lay the groundwork for the success in Paris. This 180 page encyclical, the Catholic Church made it its latest and strongest stand on the environment. Pope Francis wasn't the first pope 
to speak out in, about the environment. His predecessors, Benedict and John Paul, did the same, just not at the same level. Francis asserts that it is possible for humanity to destroy life on Earth through the unabated extraction and burning of fossil fuels. He argues that global warming hurts the poor and vulnerable nations the most, and that it is in every human being's moral duty and responsibility to combat these challenges, and he is not alone. Last August, Islamic leaders from 20 countries called on the world's 1.6 billion, billion Muslims to support a strong Paris Agreement. It's called the Islamic Declaration on Global Climate Change. How many of you knew that that even came out? The Islamic community came out on this. John did, of course he did. And they echoed Pope Francis's statements about moving away from the environmental ravages of consumerism for the sake of protecting the poor and the planet that we all inhabit. And both documents were landmark declarations. But the truth is, Pope Francis and the Islamic leaders are actually late to the table of faith-based earth stewardship. Grassroots groups such as Sheila Kinsey's, Christian Aid, and an ecumenical group I'll talk, to in a, I'll talk about in a minute called Green Faith, among many others, have for years been pressing churches and synagogues and mosques to reduce their carbon footprints, divest from fossil fuel investments, and teach their congregations how to reduce consumption. Even evangelicals who historically have been known for their climate change denial have seen inspiring green leaders rise from the ranks, including the Reverend Richard Cizak of the New Evangelical Parza, uh, Partnership and Jim Ball of the Ev Evangelical Environmental Network. It's unprecedented. But Pope Francis, with his charisma and determination, he's made this possible. He has dramatically raised the visibility of the faith-based faith movement which hopes to have a profound impact on climate change and forest preservation, environmental protection. And he has come to this moment with great care and management savvy. I had the extraordinary opportunity to spend an hour with Cardinal Peter Turkson. This is a cardinal from Ghana. When uh, Benedict resigned, he was on the short list to become the next pope. The church is growing, the Catholic church is growing fast, fastest in Africa. And there was this thinking that it was time for an African pope, and it could have been Peter Turkson, but instead it became Francis. And Turkson was appointed to the Pontifical Council on Justice of Peace, one of the most <coughs> important councils to Pope Francis. And so Turkson was responsible for the 18-month effort that produced this document, calling on experts from around the world in climate science and sociology and economics and theology to write this incredible document. And sitting in Turkson's formal conference room just outside his office, he shocked me with his candor. Listen to this quote. At the time Pope Francis took over, the church had a lot of bruises. Pedophilia by priests would as, was at its raging height, okay? A cardinal just said pedophilia to a journalist, admitting that this is happening. I had a tape recorder running. I kept quiet. I let him keep talking. So many accusations. He set up a commission to deal with it. It's not that the bruises are gone, but his own sense of leadership, simplicity, authenticity, and credibility have helped shove a whole lot of this bad stuff into the background. Turkson wasn't finished. In a backhanded way, he acknowledged what led to Pope, Fran Pope Benedict's unprecedented resignation in 2013. He told me, it's not to say that Benedict didn't do anything, but Francis' style of leadership is different. You don't open the New York Times every day and read about pedophilia and all these scandals. It's as if those things are now a thing of the past. Now that may be a little bit of wishful thinking because the church still has scandals that it's dealing with. And they're still getting covered in the New York Times. But Turkson's point is a good one. Francis believes so fervently in the dangers of climate change and its impact on the world's poor that he is putting the message of Laudato Si out front, making it a top priority for people of all faiths to rally around, around the world. Francis has done this, Vatican observers say, because he believes strongly that fighting climate change is a moral and religious imperative. This has not been the case with our last popes. They have had other priorities. And as a bonus, Francis sees that taking a strong stand on an issue allows him to make new allies 
in new constituencies that have long been skeptical of this church. So I'd like to see a show of hands now. How many of you have a different opinion of the Catholic Church today than you did prior to Pope Francis? Yeah, one man, amazing leader. And it places him squarely on the side of the church's social justice wing, which cared little about doctrinaire priorities that were Benedict's. Remarkably, Francis has staked his papacy on being green, on taking care of the environment and the poor. And Turkson told me, this is referred to as the Pope Francis factor. Now, it's not all sunny, and it's not all optimistic. Sister Sheila invited me to a meeting while I was in Rome of 13 international monks and nuns and other faith leaders who were at the Paris Agreement at these various functions and meetings to hear what they were talking about. And there was a Franciscan monk from Brazil who cautioned that we need to approach the document as defective and fragile. He said, there is a goal to keep temperatures from warming another half degree Celsius by 2100, but there's no plan on how to actually do it. The entire agreement is voluntary, he said, with no binding language or penalties for failure of individual nations to meet their self-set carbon reduction targets. And funds to help vulnerable nations adapt to sea level rise, for example, are billions of dollars in arrears. He was a cold splash of water on all these people who came to this meeting with optimism. But there were some there that were upbeat. There were these faith leaders from Indonesia and the Philippines and Ghana and Australia. And this remarkable nun from Africa said, listen to this quote, the small people are ready to listen and act. For change to come, we need an approach from the bottom and the top. We will never ask for a plastic bag, for example. This is an action we can take. Make others conscious of our faith and take action. If the grassroots are awake, something will happen. She sounded so strong, so inspirational. It was really an awesome thing to hear that she was going to go back to Africa, to her village, and she was going to promote environmental protection. This is the flame of hope at the intersection of faith and environmentalism. Sister Sheila told me that education is the key. Faith leaders need to preach forcefully, forcefully and set consistent examples using Laudato Si as their guide. She's responsible for actually producing these study guides that are going out to every diocese, every Catholic diocese in the world to filter down from the diocese level to the Catholic schools to the churches so that this document becomes a part of Catholic education. She believes that if the church and its leaders take up this mission with great zest, the people will follow. Now I've got one more example that I want to share with you before I conclude and, and, and we'll have time for a few questions. The, Rever the Reverend Fletcher Harper is Executive Director of Green Faith, the Interfaith Partners for Action for Earth. This is a group that's based in Highland Park, New Jersey. He is uh, an Episcopal priest. He's run this organization for about um, for about 12 years. It's been in existence since 1992. And these are some of the accomplishments that Green Faith has managed. And it's a global organization with only a handful of people. But it has installed a megawatt of solar projects in the New Jersey communities in which it exists. It has advocated for state-owned vehicles to pollute less. And it successfully sued an incinerator that was violating air emission standards in the community where Green Faith is based, and they won an $850,000 settlement. And you talk with Harper for just a few minutes and you get a sense of the vast potential of the global faith community that Pope Francis envisions coming together as one, from grassroots action to solar topped roofs to courtrooms to care for what he calls our common home. But Reverend Harper is no idealist. He's a pragmatist. He knows that charisma of the kind exuded by Pope Francis can only take you so far especially in America, where, as you all know, climate deniers are still legion, at least among our elected officials. He told me the biggest danger of the encyclical, and the Pope is very aware of this, is that it's not enough. You need people to do it. That's why we're making such a big commitment to leadership training. That's what Green Faith is doing. Not just Catholics, not just Protestants, 
Hindus and Jews and Muslims, rallying a faith community all around the world to the cause of environmental protection. Reverend Harper told me, we need a green economy. Religious groups are going to start speaking out more about this. We need a commitment nationally to create millions of new green jobs. We need solar panels and wind turbines. We have to retrofit buildings all over the country and around the world so that they're more energy efficient. And think about doing that. Who will do that? I'll tell you who will do that. The people that are getting laid off right now from their oil drilling jobs and their coal mining jobs and their natural gas and fracking jobs because the bottom has fallen out of that, fallen out of that economy. And these things have to happen in places like Peru, too. And those miners can actually do jobs that are saving their country instead of destroying their environment. Solar panels and wind turbines and insulating buildings. That's how jobs are created. That's how you lift the poor out of poverty. And then he told me, and I believe this. You know, I'm covering perhaps the most grim story that we have. As a journalist, I've covered lots of horrific things. I was a police reporter for years, and I saw the creative ways in Knoxville, Tennessee, that East Tennesseans killed each other. It wasn't a pretty sight. Nothing compares, though, to the potential uh, ruination of the very planet we live on than global warming. But you can't lose hope. And Reverend Fletcher... Reverend, Reverend Harper told me, the apocalyptic narratives have to stop. All it does is scare people. Martin Luther King didn't say, I have a nightmare. He said, I have a dream. That's how we move people. That's how we affect change. So I started this talk with uh, one of my favorite quotes from Laudato Si in, in Pope Francis, and I'm going to end it with a similar quote. We need to strengthen the conviction that we are one single human family. There are no frontiers or barriers, political or social, behind which we can hide. Still less is the room for the globalization of indifference when it comes to climate change, global warming, and environmental protection. Thank you. <laughs> Who's got a question? Yes. Yeah, that's a tough one. Uh, we have a lot of people on this earth. We have a lot of people to feed. Uh, a, a big percentage of the earth's population depends on fish. Um, I was in Belize last week with a lot of these students here that, that were in a coral conservation class, and we saw firsthand the ravages of uh, warming ocean temperatures and dying coral reefs and um, declining fish populations. Uh, population is a big deal and it is running rampant in the poorest countries. I don't, kn I don't know what we're going to do about this, not when the Catholic Church, not when this incredible pope maintains this antiquated position on birth control and family planning, not when conservatives in this country are waging war against family planning. It's, um, it's counterintuitive. So, um, so I try to stay optimistic, but if you ask me enough hard questions, I'll get negative, because <laughs> this is a tough topic. Well, I mean, I'm going to switch to a positive. 50 cities contribute 75% of carbon emissions. 50 of the world's largest cities contribute 75% of carbon emissions. And what that means is 
mayors have a more direct impact on environmental protection than national governments do, and a whole lot more uh, motivation to do so. And so that's why you see Mayor Bloomberg, former Mayor Bloomberg, leading this mayor's initiative in places like Mumbai and Rio de Janeiro, in Chicago and Los Angeles and New York and Beijing. The opening day of the Paris summit, there was an announcement in Beijing that told people not to go outside. Do not go outside today. The air is too unsafe to breathe. The irony of that was not missed by anyone. So there's this sense that maybe we can scale this down and deal with it city by city instead of nation by nation. So there's a little bit of hope for you. Daniel. You know, they move these meetings around. And, uh, and it really is incumbent upon the leaders of those countries to go back and implement what they said they're going to do. Now, keep in mind that it's, we're only talking about 15 countries. Out of 196, it's really only 15 or so, if you count the European Union as one, that are, that are, that are polluting the most. The rest of the world is being damaged by it. So, so it's really incumbent upon the developed world who has had the benefits of, of uh, carbon energy to figure out how to wean themselves off that and provide support for nations like Peru and nations throughout Latin America and Sub-Saharan Africa, and Indonesia, where uh, they almost have no choice but to destroy their environments in order to provide a living for their, uh, for their people. Um, but this green economy, there's some real hope there if we can get some momentum behind it and we can get some people uh, investing more in it. And when you think about it, it's, it's not working right now. It's, it's not working as it should. Like this is the moment when we really can shift away from oil and gas and fracking because there's, y you just can't make any money drilling for oil at $30 a barrel. So solar should be going through the roof. Wind should be going through the roof right now but the subsidies aren't there. Uh, the subsidies are still there for fossil fuels. A question. A question. So, so I wonder what you guys think. I wonder. Go ahead. You know, that's, that's a really tough one, right? So, um, so nuclear power scares the heck out of everybody. But the fact of the matter is, if you look at the history of nuclear power and you forget, if you just forget for a moment that we don't really know what to do with these spent fuel rods, just set that aside, okay, just for a minute. Um, this is an energy source that has been remarkably safe around the world consistently. We've really had only two accidents. Chernobyl, which was a failure of competence, and Fukushima, which was a freak of nature. Three Mile Island didn't really, in the United States in 1979, like, like Three Mile Island is still in existence, it's still creating energy in central Pennsylvania. They didn't have a meltdown there, they contained it. And everywhere else where there's nuclear energy, it's working. And it's carbon zero. So, so I just think that it was kind of a political decision. Like how could they do anything else but that? But, but Germany also closed down their nuclear power plants, and lots of other nuclear power plants in fear closed in Europe as well after Fukushima. And that makes it tougher, particularly when fossil fuels are so cheap. I'll tell you a quick story about Norway. Norway uh, is a country with a population half the size of North Carolina. Yet when it goes to these climate summits, it is viewed as every bit as influential as the United States, as China, as the European Union, because um, because they have billions and billions of dollars that they use to protect forests, particularly in Brazil. It's an amazing thing. I got to interview the equivalent of the Norwegian Santa Claus. His name is Per Faro. He gets to give away these billions of dollars. He gets to decide which forests are going to be saved and preserved. 
So basically what he says is here's the value of that forest. If you tear it down and use it for logging, or use it for ranching, or use it for the oil that's underneath, we're going to pay you that money instead to keep those trees standing because those trees are carbon sponges, as most of you guys know. But where does Norway get this money? Oil. They have a state-owned oil company. And they have no need for that oil because they're such a small country. But they export it. They're Europe's number one exporter of oil. They're the world's 15th largest exporter of oil. But they don't get the blame for burning that carbon because somebody else burns it. And there's this thinking, and I wrote about this for Manga Bay, there's this thinking that Norway could be the country that comes off the carbon grid. It could be the one that says, this is how it's done. This is a homogenous country where everybody's educated, where everybody uh, has money. They have a sovereign wealth fund with more than a trillion dollars in it. If they distributed it, every single Norwegian would be a millionaire tomorrow. Okay? It's all from oil. It's all from the North Sea. They could be a leader in this, but even Norway can't wean itself off, off fossil fuels. Stad Oil has plans to drill for the next 30 years. That's the kind of stuff that just, you're just like, ah, oh, jeez. Like, this one should be easy. But nothing is easy when it comes to this. Nothing. It's all complicated. And when you talk to a woman like I did in Leroya who says, I love the Pope, but there's nothing more important than he can say than that plant reopening that's killing my children, you know how desperate people are. You know how complicated this subject is. And you know, uh, even with the Pope's popularity and charisma, how hard it's going to be to make change. Buck. That was kind of a trick question. <laughs> of course. Of course, like that's, like that's the only means of fighting back. Like when these companies no longer make money, they're no longer going to be in business. And it's not, I don't, I, I got a couple minutes left here, and I want to say, I, I don't want to demonize these fossil fuel companies or industries, whether it's coal or gas or natural gas. They've enabled the prosperity that we enjoy. These lights are on because Duke Energy right now is burning coal at a power plant five miles from here. We all drive cars that burn gas. We enjoy enormous prosperity because we were first in line in the whole creation of a carbon-based economy. And now it's time to change. And we have the capacity to change. We really can reduce our carbon emissions tremendously and shift to renewable sources of energy. 150 corporations have signed a pledge with the White House to be carbon neutral by 2025. One of them is VF Corporation, which is in Greensboro, which is the world's largest apparel maker. They buy 1% of the world's cotton. Talk about a company that's affected by climate change. Wherever there's drought, they have a problem. Wherever there are storms, it affects their supply chain. They want this problem fixed. And there are lots of other companies that are on board as well. Every food company, every large food company is behind this push to decarbonize. In many ways, the only ones who aren't are the ones that are making money in it. How do we get them to shift? How do we get them to move away? It's their world too. They're not going to be able to build a big enough air conditioner. And, uh, and when it becomes uninhabitable in Latin America because it's too hot and you can't grow crops there anymore, those people are coming north. And Donald Trump isn't going to be able to build a wall high enough or long enough to keep them out. He just isn't because it wasn't their fault, and it's not their fault. And, and uh, John Knox, who just left it, uh, a, a few moments ago, has been to some of these island nations. They burn no fossil fuels. Seychelles or the Marshall Islands, and <laughs> they're going underwater. They're going to be underwater. And so they want to be compensated by wealthy first world countries to build seawalls. And we should compensate them for that so they can adapt to climate change. All these things are in the work. All these things are in the Paris Agreement. This agreement should have been passed 20 years ago. Things would be a lot easier now. <laughs> but it passed now. 
and the window hasn't closed. And uh, if the faith community gets behind this in a big way, you have billions of people pushing for environmental protection, billions of people demanding a reduction in the carbon footprint, growing more trees, using less plastic, recycling more, divesting from, from these carbon-based companies. We can bring about this change. Thank you.